Hello, I think I'm live. Just uh, obviously not even quite time for the workshop yet, so I'm just going to kind of chill out and let people join. just uh, communicating with my colleague here, just making sure that, um, you know, we're all on the same page and we start at the right time and everything. What's up, Zenta? What's up? Yeah, that's what I love to see, people communicating in the infamous troll box. Um, I'd love, you know, feel free to chat it up in there, talk about where you're from, why you're tuning in. Um, remember, we have an ask a question box um, that you can use to ask questions throughout the, the workshop, um, and I, I certainly hope that you have them. There's a lot to talk about today. Um, yeah, so don't, don't feel like... Uh, you're, I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. I have my uh, cup of coffee, so that always puts me in a good mood. Um, yeah, don't feel like as I'm presenting that you're like talking over me if you if you use that chat box. Uh, I, I hope that you guys, <laughs> hello world, I hope that you guys uh, interact with each other. Um, just remember that the best way to ask questions is with the, the ask a question uh, button down there. Um, and you feel free to use that uh, that chat box to interact with each other. Is this anyone's like first time at a substrate uh, event? Actually, why don't I go ahead and I'll I'll create a poll. So right next to the ask a question box, there's a poll, and so I'm going to create a poll right now. All right, so you should see that poll down there, and if you see that, then it'll also be very clear to you where the um, where the ask a question button is. So I think we're probably going to be going live pretty soon. I do have a lot of stuff to cover today. Um, yep. Yeah, so, uh, Ivana, if you don't have any problems with me starting the seminar, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, and I'm also going to close my riot. Okay, great. Um, cool. So, my name's Dan Forbes. I'm a developer advocate with Parity Technologies. And so uh, what that means is that it's my job to kind of help it make it easy for people to understand the capabilities that Parity exposes by way of our technologies. And then also, of course, reduce the friction that they experience when they consume those technologies. And so the point of the workshop today is really to kind of introduce substrate and, and the parity ecosystem of tools to people who are really thinking about building a blockchain solution. So um, what I'm not going to do today is kind of tell you what a blockchain is and all that kind of stuff. I, I assume that, that that's kind of something you're already familiar with. But what I do hope that you understand today is a little bit better about how substrate approaches the the rather daunting task of building a blockchain what are some of the decisions and opinions that it takes um then we'll kind of dive in a little bit into how you can actually 
consume those capabilities and use them to build a blockchain. And then in particular, what I'm going to highlight is kind of the rich, rich ecosystem of tools and utilities that exist around Substrate uh, that really makes all this stuff easy for builders to bring stuff to market in a, in a short period of time. Um, and so with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and open up my slides. Just give me one second here. So actually what I can do is I can make these slides available to everyone. Let's see. Sorry about that. So I'm going to drop here in the chat the link to the slides that I'll be looking at. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and head over there myself. And now I should be able to share my screen. Okay. Um, oh, I see. I shared the wrong one. One second. share this screen. Okay, I was afraid I was going to disconnect. Okay, I'm just going to do my entire screen. We'll keep it simple. Okay, so here are our slides that we're going to go through today. I already introduced myself enough talking about me, let's talk about Substrate. Um, so Substrate is a framework for building blockchains. It's a, a library, a toolkit, uh, you know, code that helps you write blockchains. And in particular, the, the design decision that Substrate really makes, really the kind of key thing that you want to key into is that it's, it's modular, composable components that are designed to be relatively flexible, which of course means abstract. And if like me, you're a software engineer or someone who's accustomed to interacting with code and, and writing code, um, you're probably kind of familiar with this idea that there's this tension between reusability and abstraction and kind of how easy it is to understand something. So I hope that this workshop today kind of helps address that tension a little bit. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm not the first person, of course, to, to recognize this tension. I'm just going to take a quick look at the chat and make sure that no one's complaining about everything. Anything looks good. Okay. Um, I'm, of course, not the first person to, to recognize this tension. The people who are writing Substrate are super smart, and, and they understand that it's a, it's a beast. It's a big framework with lots of components, lots of abstractions. And so in order to help people use Substrate in a way that's really easy, uh, they've created sort of this framework to help you write blockchain runtimes in, in particular. And we'll talk a little bit more about what a blockchain runtime is, uh, but basically we call that frame. So Substrate is a framework for building blockchains. That means the blockchain node, uh, it has mechanisms to handle consensus and RPC servers and all of these other things. And then one component of a blockchain, one very important component of a blockchain is of course the runtime. And so Frame is sort of this library, this framework that's meant to help you write blockchain runtimes that are designed for substrate. And to kind of keep in mind, keep in line with this modular approach, we call Frame modules palettes. And of course, you can kind of mix and match and build palettes, just like you would mix and match and build um, NPM libraries or something like that. This is a very common pattern of creating reusable modular libraries of code. And of course, all of this stuff that, that we're building here at Parity is on top of the really world-class research of the Web3 Foundation. They're the, the academics, the researchers churning out the cryptographic, consensus-based token economics research that, that we're building all of this on top of. Just gonna check and see, no questions, no one's complaining. Um, so let's dig into these design principles a little more. I, I talked a little bit about what 
a substrate blockchain is, but we can learn a little bit more about it. And I want to thank my coworker, Zofia, who came up with this amazing diagram. I created something that you would uh, look like you would expect a software engineer to come up with, and she helped me turn it into something worthwhile. Um, so the runtime is a, it's a rather uh, abstract concept to try to wrap your mind around, but basically it is the the environment where blocks are processed and the state changes that they define are validated and incorporated into the evolving state that your blockchain is representing. So the runtime is really the execution logic of the block time. And so that's something that Substrate kind of makes some assumptions around and, and kind of defines in, in special ways. And in particular, um, having the runtime itself become a part of the state of the blockchain is this very core concept to Substrate. And many of you are probably familiar with the fact that Substrate enables forkless runtime upgrades. You don't need to fork your blockchain in order to introduce new block execution logic. And the way that that's enabled is by compiling the runtime down to a WASM blob, which can then become part of storage and it's then subject to all of these consensus mechanisms. And so that enables things like forkless runtime upgrades. And then of course, we're defining other primitives on top of the runtime. Like what exactly is a block? to substrate and, and a block to substrate is relatively specific. It's a header, a cryptographic digest that encapsulates all the cryptography. And then it's a vector of what we call extrinsics, but it's basically just transactions. So uh, the cryptographic information associated with the block and then all the transactions that happen in that block. Um, the substrate client is something that we define. It's this node that contains all these things that we're talking about. There's the peer-to-peer -peer networking, which helps us communicate with the other actors that are part of the consensus system. There's an RPC server that allows people to interact with the node. This kind of, uh, it's like the API to the node. We have telemetry that's very useful for production blockchains that need to be analyzed and whatnot. And then there's a kind of this uh, implementation detail, optimization detail that, that the runtime can be compiled to a native binary that's embedded within the client. Um, but that's really an optimization detail. And so that's why you see this kind of de-emphasized the core of substrate is this idea of this WASM runtime that's included as part of storage. Um, so these are kind of some of the really key design principles of substrate that I just went over, you know, kind of encompassing everything about consensus and RPC and runtime and storage. And then frame is, of course, only concerned about this runtime piece. And so how does frame make it easy for you to build a runtime it does so by defining a really powerful and really friendly macro language which is kind of like a programming language within a programming language and, and we're going to dig into that a little bit more and then that programming that that macro language helps you interact with some of these runtime primitives like storage and events and errors which we'll dig into more uh, but before i do that i'm just going to come over here i don't see any questions don't even see any uh, chatting going on. I'm worried that I'm not even live. So you guys come alive, talk, ask some questions. I hope that this is exciting and interesting and, and you're enjoying it. Help, help me know that I'm not just in my office talking to myself. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's talk a little bit about, about frame and exactly what it is. Um, so as I said, frame, one way to think about it is it's a library that helps you compose your runtime by putting together palettes, different modules. And so there are kind of these pre-built palettes that, that uh, Parity and the Web3 Foundation curates. And it's it, you can really create a fully functional, feature complete, useful blockchain network only by composing the, the palettes that, that Parity maintains. And of course, we also make it easy for you to write your own 
palette and, and incorporate, encapsulate your own custom logic. And so when you write a palette, what you're doing is you're defining how that unit of logic is going to interact with the storage of your runtime. It's going to define some dispatchable transactions, some of these extrinsics that people can use to interface with that logic. There are errors and events, which is basically the objects that your runtime uses to communicate when something bad has happened in the case of an error or that something expected has happened in the case of an event. Um, we use a, a, a kind of rust type of interface called a trait to help us configure our palettes. And I'll show you what that means. And then <clears throat> A palette can also be included in another palette. And so in addition to defining these dispatchable transactions that can be invoked from outside of the blockchain, uh, you can define public interfaces and functions that you can call into from other units of code. Um, awesome. Thank you, Zenta. I appreciate your, um, your involvement. Uh, so before, let me just make sure I remember. Yeah, cool. So uh, we've kind of talked a little bit about what substrate is, what frame is. Let's take a second to actually look at some code. Um, so there is a node template that is actually, it's exactly what I described. It's a fully functional blockchain node that's basically created by um, just composing some frame palettes that already exist. So whenever you're working with Substrate, especially now that we're, we're still in kind of a, we're in a release candidate phase, you always want to make sure you're looking at a particular version, a particular tag. And so right now our most recent release is 2.0 RC5, which is called River Dolphin. I think that's really cute. So let's, uh, let's take a look at uh, what a palette looks like in RC5. And so this is part of this node template, which is really where I spend a lot of my day living and breathing. It's a fully functional blockchain node that really exists for educational purposes. Um, and so here you can see that we are defining the storage, the runtime storage that this palette manages. So this is a macro, Deckle storage is a macro. So this is basically some code that's going to write other code for us and make it really easy for us to do these really powerful, flexible, abstract things. But basically, uh, one of our uh, community members described it this way, and I, I really liked it. One way to think of this is this is kind of a friendly place that we've given you to uh, help you understand where to define these capabilities. It's this very idiomatic code block, Deckel storage, and this is where you declare your storage. And so if you look at this, you can see that what we're declaring is, I'm not going to go deep, deep down. I could do a whole workshop on declaring storage items. So we're not going to get too deep into the weeds. There is documentation here that you can and should look at to learn more about this. But for the purposes of this workshop, what I want you to take away from this is that we're defining a storage item. We're assigning it the name something, because again, this is just a template project. It's basically meant to be wiped away. Uh, so we're just storing something. This is some synt syntactic sugar that, that helps you interact with that storage item. And then we're defining the type of the storage item here. So it, it's an option, which means it basically may or may not exist. And then it's an unsigned integer. So then we can kind of see similar patterns for other things. <clears throat> and again, I would really encourage you to learn more about these by going to the, the documentation for them. But for now, what you can see is that we have this idea of a, an event and just like we had a macro to define our storage items, we have a macro to define our events. And we want to be able to notify blockchain users, notify the people that are dispatching these extrinsics, 
that it was successful. And so the way that blockchains tend to do that, if you're familiar with the blockchain ecosystem, this event pattern is probably not a new one to you. And so here we're just defining a type of event and it's going to tell a user of our blockchain that something has been stored. And then we're going to tell them what has been stored and who stored it. Pretty straightforward. Um, now, of course, there may be errors. So here we have our macro that helps us define our errors. What if someone tries to store the, a null value? We, we are deciding in our logic that that is an error case. You could equally define your runtime run logic to where that wouldn't be an error case. And so this is an example of how these palettes allow you to define really the storage is really the key. This is the, <clears throat> the platform on which you're building your capabilities is the storage. Then you want to create ways that people interface with that storage. And so it, it, the, the abstraction that we are creating on top of this storage is that it's not valid to store a none value. And so we have defined now a, uh, an error that helps us express that to users of our blockchain. And now, finally, we have this decal module macro. This is where we define the dispatchable functions that, that our, our palette exposes. And so, again, not going to get really super deep into the weeds here, but if, if you're someone who's thinking about writing a blockchain, I assume you've probably written a code function before. And so you can see that basically what we've done is using this macro language, we've made it really easy to just define a normal old code function that calls into a helpful library of code to really dispatch some somewhat complicated blockchain logic. That's what a good code framework is supposed to do is abstract away a lot of this complexity. And so that's what Substrate is doing here. So weights are, you know, if you come from the Ethereum ecosystem, you may be familiar with the idea of gas, which helps you ensure that users are <clears throat> paying for the computational resources that they're consuming. Um, so this is, you know, kind of the Substrate way of, of defining that. Uh, this is how you make sure that the transaction is signed and that it's valid and, and you can we'll, we'll even talk about some ways that you can put additional logic on top of that uh here we're we're updating our storage and then we're emitting an event so just you can see it's just a super straightforward way of writing a normal code function that encapsulates pretty powerful blockchain logic here's an example um of where we may return an error so basically same idea, but just demonstrating returning an error because in this function, we're only emitting an event. Um, so that's our template project. Let me go see if we have, if we have questions. I'd like to, oh, increase the font size. I'm sorry, I'll do it next time. Thank you, Ivana. Sorry, I don't understand the purpose of Decal. Great question. Let's go back there and I will increase the font size. Um, so wait, let me, Ivana reminded me of this. I am answering the question, sorry, I really don't understand the purpose of these decal macros, which is a really, really good question. So let's go back over here and let's go to my palette. And I haven't forgotten to increase the font size, don't worry. Oh, and actually that reminds me, there was one thing I didn't talk about. Okay, so basically here's a here's a decal block. This in, so Substrate is written in the Rust programming language, but really I think I was actually having a conversation with Fred, our, our CTO yesterday, always wonderful to get to hear his insights into this stuff. Obviously he has like arguably one of the most valuable insights. Um, and he really likened what we're doing to Ruby on Rails. Um, so this is kind of a quick aside here, which is to say that when you're writing Substrate, you are writing Rust. Just like when you're writing Ruby on Rails, you are writing Ruby. But anyone who's really a Ruby on Rails programmer would describe themselves as such. That is such a powerful, rich, robust, idiomatic framework that people who develop on Rails, they, they've 
they almost don't consider themselves Ruby developers, they consider themselves Rails developers. So in a similar fashion, Substrate is written in Rust. You're certainly writing Rust when you write Substrate, but really it's these macros. And in Rust, the way that you identify a macro is with an exclamation point at the end. So that's how you know that this is a Rust macro. And, and as I said, a macro is almost like a programming language within a programming language. Um, this right here is essentially under the hood, it's code that writes other code. But really that's all that a programming language is is code that writes other code you have keywords like in rust you have pub to indicate that something is public i'm sure you're familiar with the enum keyword if you're coming from like java or something like that so basically in substrate this is a keyword decal error it this keyword is implemented as a macro but abstract that away it's not really important What's important is this is a keyword that sets off this block of code now. And now within this block of code, I am declaring errors. And there is some syntax, just like in any programming language, you have to use the right syntax. There's syntax around that macro. And you can go and you can read about the syntax for that. Um, but really what I... I I really hope you take away from this is don't be scared of these macros. Don't feel like there's something different than what you interact with as a software engineer because it's they're not. They're just keywords that sets off blocks of code. I hope that's helpful. Uh, are there any estimates for the Substrate 2.0 stable release? Uh, that is out of the scope of this workshop, that, that question. Uh, really, the, the scope of this workshop is, as I described, help you understand how Substrate works and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so not really going to answer that question. It looks like we have some comments there, which are probably very helpful. Question from YouTube. Is there a palette for zero knowledge proof? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, uh, the short answer is I don't know. The slightly longer answer is I think there may be, but I can't quite remember at this time. The even longer answer is, Zenta, I think you need to write it. That sounds like such a great idea. Like even if there is already a zero knowledge proof palette, it's probably not the only one that can or should ever exist. Um, and a palette is exactly, that's a, a great question. And um, let's do some research. Um, we have a Riot channel. And Ivana, I'll ask you to please drop in the, the chat there the link to the Riot channel. So that's a great question to, to bring to Riot. And, and we can talk about it more there. Thank you for asking that. Um, OK. So I'm going to close this now. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I did want to talk about one other thing, this trait trait. Um, so I don't, I'm, I'm already kind of going over story of my life, but, but I do want to take a second to talk about this. So we, we talked about this idea that substrate is very general, don't like to make a lot of assumptions about the way that things go down. Um, and so that means that we really focus on interfaces as opposed to implementation. So one thing to keep in mind is that in Rust, we call interfaces traits. Don't be scared by this word. It just means interface. And now I am actually working to get this name changed. Maybe this is one reason why we're not at, at Substrate 2.0 yet. Um, but basically, I think it would be more useful to think of this as being called configuration, uh, because obviously the word trait appears right here. You know it's a trait. Um, it, this is really how you configure the palette. And so because we don't make a lot of assumptions in substrate, in frame, we don't, for instance, really want to make a lot of assumptions around what an event is. We talked about events. We talked about this idea that they're very a common pattern. It's something that your blockchain emits to let other people know that something happened. But we don't really 
want to specify the implementation of what that event is. We just want to be able to say to this palette, hey, if you need to emit an event, this is kind of the interface that you use to do so. And so this trait is exactly how we do that. This is how we specify, this is how we configure those interfaces. And so as you can see here, because this palette emits events, it needs to know what the runtime's definition of the event is. And so if we weren't emitting events, we wouldn't need to configure this trait here. But since we are going to emit events, we need to configure this palette to kind of understand how the runtime thinks of an event. And as I show you more code, I'll dig a little bit deeper into that, but I wanna kind of help myself keep moving along. And so I'm gonna close this window for now. Let's see if there's, we have another question. Thank you, Ivana, for sharing that. Sorry, what happens if we write error code in Deckle storage and vice versa? It probably won't compile. I, I don't know, um, but I would like, essentially what you're asking me is like, what would happen if I started to declare a hash map and then started writing an if statement? I don't know, undefined behavior. The compiler would not be happy. Um, and so, again, just like you probably wouldn't ask yourself what would happen if I started defining an if statement in the middle of declaring a hash map, uh, don't even really ask yourself that question. Um, think of using the macros for what they're supposed to be be used for. Deckle storage is meant to declare storage and that's what you should use it for. Um, and, and don't try to write error code in Deckle storage because that's not, that's not why we created it. Um, yeah, good question. Uh, okay, so let's keep moving along. Um, so we talked a lot about palettes. I'm gonna quickly show you guys the recipes because I think this is a really important tool for developers. Uh, I like to think of recipes as a, a collection of, of answers to stack overflow questions that we anticipate people asking. So if you're writing a palette or a runtime or a substrate node, you're probably going to run into some common Oops, sorry, some common problems, which of course then have patterns that, that people use to get around them. And so recipes along with these template projects are a really key resource that developers can use to help them implement these common patterns that they want to. Finally, of course we have, well not finally, but of course we also have a front end template and I'm gonna show you a fork of that front end template today as we continue to demonstrate some of these capabilities. And in particular, I'm gonna actually demonstrate some of these capabilities by way of this enterprise sample. Just quickly checking how things are going. Okay, good. Um, so basically this is kind of taking this node template and really, really all of these resources here. And this is kind of parody taking all of this and taking on the perspective of an enterprise user who wants to build an end-to-end -end fully functional enterprise use case on top of Substrate. And so that's what we did. And I'm gonna kind of walk you through that here in the next couple minutes. Um, I'll quickly talk about it. It's a semi-permissioned network. And so one of the things we're really gonna talk about in the sample is role-based access control. I, that's, I come from an enterprise background and that's something that is intuitively very important to me. We're gonna showcase this kind of multi-palette architecture that's really you know, taking frame beyond the node template, which I showed you and really using it in the real world. Um, we're not really gonna talk about the off-chain worker, but the enterprise sample does include an off-chain worker. If you come from other blockchain ecosystems, you may be familiar with this idea of an Oracle. And in fact, we talked about it at, at seminar on Tuesday. Seminar is a great way to get involved in the Substrate community. And Ivana, if you wanna drop a link to seminar, uh, that would be super helpful. Um, and so off-chain workers are, are kind of one way that you can implement Oracle-like capabilities in Substrate. And, and so the enterprise sample includes an off-chain worker. Pretty much that's all I'm gonna say about it. Um, 
but you should look into it and learn more about it and come chat with us about it in our Riot channel. Um, and, and what I'm going to use to demo, demo all this is a fully featured um, UI that we, we, you, we created with that front end template. Um, okay, so let's see. I'm, this is actually running on my computer now, so I'm just going to stop it so we can kind of start from scratch and this is just me kind of cleaning up my dev environment. Um, okay, so this is the enterprise sample repository. As you saw, I, I got it just by clicking on this link right here, so you should all be able to access it as well. And it it is this kind of full end-to-end -end thing that I'm going to demonstrate today. It has the chain, which is the whole substrate piece of this. You can see now this looks very similar to the node template. We have a, a palette and we have the runtime. Um, we have some code that we're not going to look into, but this is code that you can run. It is a uh, JavaScript code that you can use to configure your chain. So again, this is kind of something that's there. It's using these ecosystem tools, um, but we're, we're not really going to talk about it today, but I kind of want to show it as part of this walkthrough of the code. Um, what else do we have here? Um, we have the UI, which we'll look at, but let's take a little bit of a deeper dive into the chain before we go into the demo. And let's see. So I'm going to go back to the palette. So this time I'm actually going to open, this is not the template palette. This is an actual custom palette with useful custom logic that's been written for this demo. This really encapsulates the, the business logic that we're going to show in this demo, or at least a piece of it, because we are using a multi-palette architecture. And I'll show you a little bit of how that manifests. But this should all look very familiar to you now. We're declaring errors, we're declaring events, we're declaring storage, some, some interfaces that we can use to, to interact with all of these things. Um, and so one of the things that I talked about was configuring this palette for the runtime. So let's take a look at how we did that. So now we are in the runtime uh, and we're in the, the, the lib, the main implementation. And so we were just looking at the registrar palette that's defined in this project. So here, let's just do it this way. I'm going to search for registrar. So here you can see we are implementing that trait that I talked about that you can kind of think of as being for configuration. We're implementing that configuration trait for the registrar palette for the blockchain runtime. And so you can see, as you look around here, we're doing this for many different palettes. So this is exactly what I'm talking about, creating a runtime by composing multiple frame palettes that all define individual little pieces of logic. And so in order to use frame to compose the runtime that way, the first thing you have to do is implement this configuration trait. So we are saying, okay, for that palette, we're providing the event type, just like we talked about how we would have to do that. And we're saying for this palette, when we implement it for the runtime, the event that that palette depends on, it is the event of our runtime. We're configuring that interface. And so now what we do is you see there's this construct runtime and what is it? Because it ends with an exclamation point, it's a macro. This is our construct runtime macro. So this is like a, a keyword that's setting off this idea that now what we're gonna do is define our runtime by assembling all of these palettes that we previously configured. And so <clears throat> this is the implementation of the palette within our runtime. And then this is the name that we give that module to the outside world. So you can basically, anytime you're looking at a frame runtime, really what you want to do is you want to find this construct runtime macro. And then you can come here and you can look and you can see, okay, what are the capabilities 
that define this runtime. System is basically, this is like frame. This is the frame system. So this, it's like necessary. And then you can look and you can see, okay, so this runtime, it has this idea of a timestamp. That's actually a very powerful idea in a blockchain and, and frame makes that so easy. And, and you can keep going and you can see this is where we're actually defining all the, the domain specific logic for this demo that we're, I'm going to get to, um, I promise. So that's how you use frame to construct a runtime. Let's see if we have any questions about that. Is there a way to download the slides as a PDF? Great question. Um, yes, short, short story, yes. Join us in Riot Technical and we'll, we'll talk about the details. Um, okay, let's see it in action. So this is basically my code editor. I use Visual Studio Code, um, it, but you can see that this is the project that we were just looking at. It has the chain, the chain story, the listener, the UI. Um, if you're familiar with Rust, you're probably familiar with the idea that compile times are pretty long. So unfortunately, one thing I'm not going to be doing in this workshop today is writing code and compiling it and deploying it. I'm going to be relying on previously compiled code, but I think it's still going to be really powerful to kind of walk you through these capabilities. Um, so I'm going to launch the chain. Uh, so I did this already, but just to show you guys. First, I'm going to make sure that kind of we're starting from a clean slate. There's no state in my blockchain. So, yep, and you can see it didn't exist because I already did this. So now I can go ahead and I'll, I'll launch the chain in dev mode. That's what these flags mean. So now... I'm launching that substrate based chain that, that's defined by that runtime that we just looked at. And you can see that because we're running it in dev mode, it's only expecting a single node. So it lets us kind of do it all locally. And even though we only have one node, you can see that we are not only creating blocks, we're actually finalizing blocks. Um, so that's, that's pretty cool. So now we have our chain running. Uh, and so now I'm going to go ahead and launch the UI, and this should open up my browser for me. And this UI that I'm opening was forked off of the front end template. Front end template makes it really easy to, to build these kinds of UIs. So just kind of uh, getting started there. Um, so this is just a friendly landing page for you. Uh, but the demo here, of course, is really up here. So what this demo encapsulates is a supply chain that's managed by a decentralized consortium. And I have the awesome opportunity to work with one of our great interns here at, at Parity, Zeke. And he asked the totally awesome question, which is, why the heck do people always use supply chain as an example for blockchain? Great question. It's also really easy to answer, thankfully, because um, it's a it's just a perfect use case. What is a blockchain? It is a way <clears throat> for people that don't really trust each other to come to consensus on the state of a system. And so what is a supply chain? In effect, it's a bunch of businesses that don't trust each other because they're all effectively in competition with one another. But in order to do their jobs, they need to be on the same page about the state of the supply chain. And so that's why this is such a powerful example because it's a really, I hope that this becomes a real thing in the real world. This is, how, this is what blockchain does, these kind of governance kind of things. Um, yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to use Substrate to define this consortium, create some roles around it, and, and I am going to be glossing over some of the capabilities to, to try my best to fit this in the time period. Um, so one thing is that uh, in the real world, you would not be using this kind of Alice account that's been pre-configured as, as an admin to do all of this. You would create another account and you would use some of the role-based access controls that I'm talking about to define much more granular, secure permissions. But for the purpose of this demo, we're going to kind of do it the simple way. So Alice is going to... Uh, sorry. Uh, create her organization, and I'm going to call it Substrate Developer Hub. So effectively, 
Alice is now a proxy for this organization. In some ways, Alice is this organization. So we're going to create this. And this is all this magic that you're seeing. This is all wrapped up in the, um, the front end template. So the front end template, if you've ever written a React front end before, it has all the APIs, everything. You just have to plug it in to, to normal React type stuff. So we created the organization. Now what I'm going to do is use this. I'm going to get Bob's account ID. So I can use this to copy his account ID paste it in here. Now I'm going to switch back to the Alice user, the admin of the organization, and I'm going to add Bob to this organization that I just created. So that was successful. So now we can come over here to members and we're going to start creating some roles that people can use to uh, manage these capabilities. In an enterprise setting, we, we want some kind of role-based access control. So that's what we're going to do. So now that Alice has added Bob to her organization, uh, she wants to be able to manage the permissions in that organization. So again, because we're doing things in kind of a weird way, Alice is going to have to assign the manage permission to herself. Um, that's an artifact of this idea that I'm, I'm not really using things the way that they're supposed to be used. So let's start by doing that. We are going to give Alice the manage. Per so first we have to create this permission. We're going to create it for, for two of these palettes. So basically giving Alice the ability to manage the access controls around these palettes. So first we're going to give her uh, managing capabilities for the registry and then some tracking. So again, these are capabilities that you would expect to see in a supply chain system that have been encapsulated as pallets. And now Alice has the permission. We've used some of these capabilities to give her the permission to manage the access around these capabilities. So now we're going to create a couple. Oh, wait. So we actually have to assign these to Alice first. Let me let's do that first. So we're going to assign to Alice. We're using her account ID. We're going to give her the ability to manage the project registry. So that was granted product registry and also product track. So I know I'm kind of flying through a lot of capabilities. And as I expected, I have some questions. How to access the list of available macro de definitions? Is there a library discovered? Great question. Um, Ivana, can you, sorry, I clicked that before I was done answering it. My bad. Ivana, can you please drop uh, substrate.dev and there should, there's a, a link. We have documentation around our macros, absolutely. Um, so there, if we can link to substrate.dev. What are the minimal frames required? Thank you, Ivana. What are the minimal frames required for running the chain? Excellent question. So uh, quick note for terminology, it, it would be the minimal pallets required for running a frame runtime. Um, and substrate.dev. And actually, let, let's just go ahead and let me, let me show you this really quick. And I can show you, we have a search bar which works pretty well. No, not, not working here for me. So if you want to learn about run about the macros you go under runtime and you go to runtime macros and you can see here we have a bunch of macros listed but the question that i'm going to answer now is about frame and so where are we going to go we're going to go to the the frame section here um and so this actually tells you that that there is a few core parts of the frame library which need to be included and so there's the system library the executive module the support library um but i let's, let's go back to our enterprise sample the really short answer to this question is that i I think it's now been basically abstracted away to potentially just the system. I, I you don't I don't believe that you need 
to include any of the other palettes other than system. But in order to get system in here, you may need to depend on some of the other dependencies like the executive crate or whatever you want to call it. Um, but basically, um, the frame system palette is the main palette that you need to include in the runtime. Um, and we do have this, uh, let's actually go and look where where a lot of this is defined. So now I'm in the core substrate repository um, and there's this frame uh, directory here. And if we go to system and we look at its cargo.toml, you can see that the name of this package is frame system. And so this is how, this is an idiom that we've created that lets you know that this is a required module for a frame runtime. Then if we go and look at something maybe not so critical, like atomic swaps, at not every runtime would need to do an atomic swap. That's a totally optional thing. This is called palette atomic swap. And so this is a naming convention that says that a palette is kind of an optional unit of code that can be included to extend functionality, whereas anything that's prefaced with frame is core required functionality. Good question. I hope that was helpful. Okay, so let's go back over here. Uh, so we've granted Alice the manage access to tracking and stuff. Uh, now let's go ahead and give Bob the ability to execute some things. So we're going to go back to registry. We're going to create the execute permission. Created that role. And now we'll, we'll do the same for tracking. And now we're going to use Alice to assign that role to Bob. So let's get Bob's account ID. So just pasting that back in there. So now we're, we're assigning this to Bob, but we want to do this from Alice's account. So switch back to Alice here. And so we're going to assign to Bob these two execute roles that we just created. So that access was granted. And now we're going to give Bob execute on tracking. Again, these are I know we haven't quite explained what these capabilities are, but they're, you know, capabilities around supply chain management. And so now because we gave Bob these access, we're actually going to switch off of Alice. So now we can switch off of this kind of super user account to an account that has much more fine grained access controls. And let's use Bob to create some products. So we'll give them some pretty easy see I've done this before. I really like peanut butter. I don't know about y'all. So now because Bob has that access, he can do that. Uh, let, let me just show you what would happen if we try to use another account to do this and kind of demonstrate these roles in action. Um, so I, the next one I want to create, I like bananas with my peanut butter. I think that's a great, um, it's a great combo. So let's try to create the new one from, from, oh man, we can't even do it. Like that, that, just how robust and, and user friendly all of these mechanisms are. Bob Stash doesn't even have the capability. Um, and if we were to try to do this, it would fail. This isn't only enforced at the UI layer, it's also enforced at the, the implementation layer. Um, but let's switch back to Bob. We can now register bananas. You noticed I changed the product ID. And so now what I can do is I can create a shipment that includes these products. Um, and of course, this is all implemented on top of this blockchain using all of these different palettes. You can see that we had the one palette to register products and the other palette to, to track shipments and, and, and whatnot. So now I'm, I'm combining all of these capabilities. I've created a shipment. Now I can go in and I can look at a shipment and I can say, okay, let's start tracking this as it, as it navigates through the supply chain. It's been picked up, you know, maybe it's going to be scanned multiple places along the way. 
and then finally, you know, we'll be able to say that it's been delivered. And this has all been implemented on top of this cryptographically sound, trustless, fully featured, robust, you know, access controlled mechanism and everything. And so, um, again, I, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds here, but let me just kind of let's just kind of look at a little bit of this stuff. Um, so let's look at the, so let me go into the runtime and into the cargo file. This is where we define our dependencies. And we're going to look at all of these different palettes that we're using to, you can see we have the palettes that are specific to this runtime. This is something I didn't even talk about. This is so cool to me. Um, there's this thing called uh, decentralized identifiers, which is a, it's a web three, uh, not web three, uh, worldwide web consortium spec of decentralized identifiers for a new exciting world. And we have used substrate to implement them. And that is included, this decentralized identifier capability is included in our runtime. Then we have, you know, the product registry capability, the role-based access control is all different capabilities. Um, and as you saw, these were all assembled as part of our construct runtime, and then we can interact with them really, really easily. Um, so let's, let me see about, no more questions, okay. So Polkadot.js is the, the API that I talked about that we're using under the hood of the, the front end template. Many of you are probably familiar with the apps UI, which you can use to interact with a number of chains. Um, so I can, you know, like if you're working on testing stuff, West End is a great network to, to kind of work with. And so I can use this apps UI, which of course is using the Polkadot.js API under the hood to connect to this chain or a number of other chains that are managed by Parity and some that are managed by other organizations like Commonwealth Labs. So this is a very flexible UI that's part of our ecosystem and, and helps bring substrate chains to market faster. And there's a, just like there's a lot more to all of this stuff, there's a lot more to Polkadot.js. And so really, I, I hope that you click through these links and learn more about it. Um, <clears throat> there is a smart contract palette that you can use to add smart contract capabilities to your runtime, because that's an important thing that people want to do. And you can even take that a step further and add EVM compatible smart contract capabilities to your runtime in the form of this EVM palette. And then we've built additional capabilities on top of that that allows for full Ethereum interoperability, and that's called the Frontier Project. And there's some really cool examples of people making the most of that. And then there's just a whole host of other tools that are out there for you to use um, and, and to make it easier for you to bring these to market and make it easier for end users to interact with them. One of my favorite, it, what this uh, picture is demonstrating here is Parity Signer, which is, it takes a, an old cell phone and upcycles it into a hardware wallet. You don't need to go out. I can't find my hardware wallet. You know, it's somewhere in here. You don't need to go out and buy a special hardware wallet. You can take this piece of technological junk that you have laying around and turn it into something really powerful and really cool. And, and so that's just something that I love. And there's just so many other examples of that that I you know don't even have the time to get into. But really the purpose of this um, presentation was really to encourage you to want to learn more, to help you understand the right questions to ask. Um, so Ivana's already shared the link to the developer hub. You can find it there on the slides. Um, <clears throat> please check out our community page. You know, we're working on a great newsletter. In the meantime, I'm publishing some, some newsletters. We have our riot chat. We talked a little bit about seminar. Um, so really this is just 
scratching the surface. And I really hope that you guys are uh, excited to learn more. Um, so I, I think that takes me to the end of my slides. We're about an hour into this now. Uh, so I don't mean to shock you too much, but I don't have anything else to say at the moment. Um, so are there any other questions? That's good. I, I feel good about that. I think we got some really good questions. So I feel like you guys were, were hearing what I was saying and um, I, I'm glad that you had questions. You absolutely should have questions. And I'm looking forward to seeing you guys in our riot chat, seeing you at seminar. Um, you should be able to find me very easily on riot and, and please do and please um, say hi to me, send me a direct message. That's my favorite thing to do. I got another question, so I'm gonna start answering it. Uh, what happens if we write in decal error uh, no, don't no need to apologize. It's not that weird of a question. Um, what what would happen? Your code won't compile. So the question is, uh, we must write storage logic inside Decal storage macro. But what happens if we write in Decal error? Um, it, I try it for yourself. Your code will not compile. You won't be able to to build your substrate chain. Um, and and it's totally reasonable to expect that that kind of thing may occur and you may not understand why your code isn't compiling and so that's exactly when you can join our, our riot chat ask us some more questions send me a direct message if, if that's the way that you feel most comfortable um yep that that's what we're here to do we're here to help you with these questions so thank you for for asking it and don't don't at all feel sorry for asking it Awesome. I see lots of thanks and have a nice day. So it's it's now the top of the hour according to my computer. So I'm going to go ahead and sign off. But thank you to Ivana for supporting me for this workshop and for helping to plan it. And thanks to Ricardo and all the awesome people who put in all the hard work into the enterprise sample and everything. Uh, thanks for listening to me. And I can't wait to chat with you guys soon in Riot. Bye bye, guys. Oh, I see wait. I can wait. I don't got anything else to do. Shing, if you have another question, feel free to just type it in the, the trunk box there. Um, yep, I see. I see your messages. Can you show me this? Waiting. how to connect the local node to the default front end that you provide. That's a really, really great question. Um, and yeah, I mean, Ivana, I hope this isn't bad, but I'll just go a little over and just, just demo this. Um, so you do have to do a little configuration to get the Polkadot.js apps UI front end, which I assume is what you're talking about. Um, you, there has to be a little bit of configuration to get that set up with the chain. So I'm, I'm not going to demo it on the enterprise chain, but what I will demo it is on the node template chain, because that should already work. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. Okay. And so I'm just going to go ahead and stop the enterprise sample stuff. Um, let's see, I'll just open up a good old fashioned terminal and I'll go to where I keep my node template. And just like you saw me do before, I'm gonna go ahead and start it up just using slightly different names, obviously, because it's a different project. It didn't exist, so already clean, great. Uh, so let's just go ahead and start up. Oh, sorry. This is probably really small. But I'm just starting up the node. There, you can probably see emojis and stuff. There you go. Uh, so now, now I have it running. <clears throat> so let's see. One really easy way to do this, and this is a, in my um, history, but I'll share it with you, is you can actually use a um, URL parameter to connect to any WebSocket endpoint that you want. And when you run the local node, it runs, you know, 
uh, 127.0.0.1 is localhost and then it's running on this port. So you can just use this and that will take you right there. And so I will put this, can you please share link to download the presentation? Uh, we'll have to get back to you on that one. Please uh, join us in our Riot chat. Um, so you can just use this URL to get there, um, but let's say that you wanna change. Um, so let's imagine that I didn't, let's, uh, actually, let's go to West End. Best when you're testing to always go to West End. So here I'm on West End, and now I'm like, oh no, I want to get back to my local node, but like I I forgot the. That's weird. I'm still. So long story short, it's down here in development, um, and you can even provide a custom endpoint. Uh, so it's all in this uh, this little menu right here. You can do any endpoint you want. It de there's a default there for local node. So I hope that's helpful and answers the question. Um, and with that, I don't see any other questions. So I am gonna sign off now because I don't want this to run too far over. Um, but I love answering these kinds of questions. Please join us in our Riot chat. Glad that was helpful, Shing. Um, yeah, thank you so much, guys. Hope to talk to you.